All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. I am Blake Thorne from Process Street. I am joined today by our CEO and co-founder, Vinay Patankar, as well as Rich Wong. Rich is a general partner with Excel. He's led investments across all sorts of exciting industries and companies, including sitting on the board at some great companies like Atlassian, UiPath, and last but not least, Process Street. Rich, thank you for being here. Great to be here, Blake. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Vinay. Good to see you. So I wanted to kick off with, um, I think, appropriate topic around process and process management. And Rich, I know you've worked with some incredible teams over the years, including companies like UiPath and Atlassian. Certainly those companies have helped facilitate process improvements across all sorts of other industries and organizations. Um, curious just what you've seen in terms of big shifts uh, over the years in how teams approach process management. Sure, sure. Look, I, I mean, I think to set some context, and, and maybe Vinay has talked about this in other uh, settings and panels as well. I think, you know, for most of the fast-growing companies and startups we work with, most people really think about core product first. And how do you make the product delightful? How do you make it great? And so this term, I think we all know, of product-led growth and really you know, tuning a business where the your product takes the lead as opposed to, say, over-investing maybe in sales or marketing, you know, I think it's become very popular. It, it makes a lot of sense. I, I would very much credit you know, companies like Atlassian. Their success has become you know, been very much by taking that product-first approach other companies, Dropbox and many others, have, have um, learned how to do that well. H however, I think what is less well understood is the topic that we're discussing today, where you know, in addition to having a great product that hopefully adopts uh, from users bottom up, the truly great companies also think about how do they constantly tune their engine, you know, metaphorically, to actually make their business run as well as possible. And that uh, tuning of the engine, that setting up of the right disciplines and processes, it actually makes an absolutely huge difference. It, it, at the simplistic level, it actually avoids a lot of foot faults. And if you have too many foot faults and tiny mistakes in the business, it can really you know, slow you down. And it more broadly creates a very healthy culture, I find, because in, in companies that have well-defined processes, you, you find they tend to be somewhat less political they're more transparent, and you actually have uh, more database decisions as opposed to, you know, opinions being the ones that, that drive decisions. And that's a lot because of the transparency that comes with that. So I, I think there's a growing um, awareness and need and understanding that great companies, the reason why they are great is because they innovate on both the axes that we just talked about. You really think about building a great product, you know, but also about you know, building discipline <coughs> in your processes. And so you know, I've seen a greater um, interest in this topic in this last the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even with Atlassian, I think that once they get to a certain size, like the size they are now, you could argue a lot of their growth is actually driven by process. It's by building out amazing marketing organizations, building out a strong channel, building out great community, and all these building out a strong, you know, expansion and sales engine for their for their enterprise business. All of that is really process driven. And while they needed a strong product to kind of get to that first stage of growth, I think to continue to expand now, especially kind of post IPO, uh, a lot of that has come from innovating on their process. Uh, just a quick double click on that. Um, how do you, you know, you've, you've been in the industry for a long time now. You've, you've seen a couple of, of booms and busts. Um, no, not how, that long, Vinay. Don't, don't overemphasize <laughs> the length of time and age. Thanks for, thanks for that. I'll remember uh, that. Well, it's, it's wisdom. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> how, how do you think that the companies have, have, have thought about approaching process in, you know, the last kind of few years as a lot of new process technology has come out versus how companies used to handle it maybe in the early 2000s or, you know, when, when the internet was just kind of getting going. Sure. I, I mean, I think um, we have two observations to that. Um, first, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that it's hard and that uh, implicitly it's not like you start having this mentality of I'm going to have this process led, you know, discipline, and everything is, is perfect, you know, in the first month or week or quarter that you start thinking about it. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that if you do 
you know, too much process too soon, it is bureaucratic and it can slow a company down. And you really don't want to do that in the most early days of a company when you're just struggling for product market fit. You're just trying to get the first product out. You need a certain intensity on that, that first axis of product, in, in my opinion, you know, when you're a pre-product company, you're just trying to get, get going. Um, and so, so I, I think one of the first things to realize is not to imagine perfection, you know, sort of from day one. Uh, I think people that expect that uh, uh, often find themselves disappointed. You have to take it in certain steps. Uh, the second, which relates to, to that point, is that I think a lot of people used to do a big bang implementation. They're like, it's now time for the super painful Oracle financials or SAP implementation. The rollout will take three years, and there's got to be lots of people doing, you know, flow charts for years or quarters at least. Yes, you know, lots of meetings. I think a really healthy change that's happened in recent years is that I think people are realizing you want to take it kind of a, a bite size at a time, you know, a piece at a time. And let's just let's not try to make it all perfect. Let's not make every every button with rounded corners. You know, let's just start by getting the obvious um, uh, organized and, and set up in a way that, that makes the organization more efficient. And you accept a certain uh, lack of uh, perfection, and you just sort of iterate yourself for it. So this you'll call it agile versus waterfall. If you want to use a development metaphor, of, it's not like you're just waiting every two years to make improvement, but you're making small improvements every month. I, I think that's the most healthy change that we've seen in recent years. Yeah, now, that was actually one of my points, and that's something we actually promote a lot here at Process Street. Uh, you would have seen from our the keynote earlier on, we're talking about one of the key tenets of modern process management is empowerment, which uh, it kind of enables people to, to in a distributed way, build and quickly iterate on their processes. And I think that this kind of philosophy of, of um, essentially adopting like the lean startup or lean product development methodology, which kind of came originally from product development, but then like applying that to process and building out process mature, like becoming a more mature process organization, but doing it in this bite-sized, iterative, quickly kind of um, yeah. improving way uh, while you're gathering data and like it, like using those processes like in real time in the organization and getting kind of real feedback on them is a big shift that we've seen. It's something we recommend a lot of our customers to do. We call it kind of lean process management. We talk about like the minimum viable process and like kind of getting that going first. And I think that is a big shift that we've seen uh, as well. Yeah, no, I mean, maybe to use a real example from my own world, um, you know, we're a venture capital firm. We have a fair bit of capital under management. We are constantly moving cash in and cash out. You know, new investments are being made. We issue term sheets. We close those investments. We wire the cash. You know, hopefully, you know, we have great you know, IPOs and, and M&A exits. And so there's, there's cash moving around all the time. You know, the, it's amazing how much time is spent constantly asking for stats and trying to figure out, has that deal closed? Have we called the capital we need? Where are we? Have the shares come in from Salesforce? What, whatever the whatever the thing is that we're dealing with at the time, it's enormously inefficient to be constantly slacking. Hey, did it happen yet? Have we gotten the legal terms? Has the wire shown up? And so that that's an example of something that just if it's set up in a great transparent process, saves an enormous amount of time. Yeah. Now, if you were to make this too big of a project and say we need to fix or improve all finance processes at Excel. And of course, there are things we, we need to work on. It would take a very long time. It would take so long that we probably wouldn't find the energy to do it. But if we just take the specific you know, status update thing of you know, when a deal uh, closes, whether it's a new investment and we're putting cash out or you know, some exit and cash is coming back in, just the status and the process of that is an example of a small thing that, that will make us more efficient. Awesome. I'd love to follow up on that, Rich, actually, with um, because it's a it's a good example and transition that you're uh, discussing there with a finance process. Um, a lot of the a lot of the tooling around process management. Um, there's a lot of great, very vertical solutions where someone might, you know, use um, Excel, other Excel uh, for their uh, for their finance process. They might have you know Salesforce for their sales process. 
And then there are, you know, more horizontal platforms, things like um, things like Process Street, UiPath, um, different ways to kind of tie tools together, or build build different processes across um, across your across your stack and across different tooling. So, any any thoughts on sort of where where your head is, how you think about the sort of very vertical versus horizontal tooling in this space? Yeah, I mean, if you don't mind odd metaphor, I think Vinay has gotten used to that in board meetings. You know, I think about the way um, a, a company's processes are, the way software is deployed in a company today, I, I would ask you to think about the metaphor of a island archipelago, which is a whole series of independent islands that until very recently are not actually very well interconnected. There are things that are, are attractive and function well kind of on the island, but it's really hard to get between the islands. And so for those of you that have you know, been to the United States and have been to the Florida Keys, the Florida Keys is a very good example of this. You start in Miami, you drive south for a good two or three hours, and there's all these little islands that are connected by a bridge system that actually allows commerce to flow across those small islands. And so I, I think what you've seen in the last uh, 10 to 20 years to try to bring the analogy together is that there has been great work and development digitizing and uh, making um, a little bit more streamlined things in a specific function. So finance has gotten better organized. HR has gotten better organized. The sales organization has their piece of software. Product development has their own piece of software. But the connective tissue that brings those together, the bridge system that ties the islands together, is only starting to be built now. And what's exciting about that is that, in my view, is where the real power is, where if you actually connect efficiency across functions. I mean, most, most things that are important that happen in a company ultimately do connect across a functional group. And so uh, th that's where I see the rising importance of of horizontal systems, you know, like a process street, or maybe a Trello would be another example, um, or, you know, signature systems like a DocuSign or a HelloSign. Those are all increasingly important as the islands, so to speak, have gotten more developed. Yeah, I'd love your, I'd love your thoughts from that, Vinay. I know we've, we've leaned into this a lot on the product side with some of the integrations we've been building. Yeah. Yeah, so, so cross-functional, which I would kind of summarize what Rich was saying, is like cross-functional processes that are basically connecting different silos or processes that work across different teams inside an organization. I think that's a big area that horizontal products like ours play with because we can work both with the marketing team and with the sales team and with the finance team, and we play equally well with those different teams that allow them to kind of get onto the same platform and have visibility and like allow them to move data and work between those different teams. The other place that I see a lot of opportunity for um, horizontal products like Process Street is in like the quote unquote long tail processes, um, where I think these are uh, areas that can be very important for a business, but are just not big enough markets for people to go out and build specific solutions for. Uh, for example, the Process Street, an area that we've uh, got some some good traction in, is around post m and integrations. So we're working with some of the, the biggest m and deals in the world, with some of the biggest companies in the world, um, helping them basically get uh, get those two companies integrated together after the acquisition happens and all the processes that are involved in that. And m and is just like, it just doesn't happen that much. Like there isn't that big of a market. Each business is not doing that many acquisitions, one or two a year are probably the most active kind of companies in the world. And um, so because of that, it doesn't really make sense to have a whole, the market doesn't support a whole vertical solution just for M&A integration, but it's a cross-functional, long-tail process. It's still incredibly important for this business. They've spent hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on this acquisition, and it's a very important strategic uh, initiative for the organization. So they, they want software and they want systems to be able to make that smooth and work as, as well as possible, but it just doesn't warrant its own kind of platform. And I think actually throw it back to Rich, I think you actually have a really good analogy for this around like the, the aircraft carrier and the kind of supporting roles as well that maybe I'll let you explain. Yeah, well, this is a uh, switching metaphors again. I mean, I think um, Vinay spent some time in San Diego as I happen to in San Diego, California, which happens to be where the United States Pacific fleet is mainly based other than Honolulu, which many of you probably know is another place where US Pacific fleet is based. 
So, you know, the, the concept simply is that there are capital ships in the modern U.S. Navy. It's the aircraft carrier. And there's a whole bunch of ships that surround the aircraft carrier to create what's called a battle group. And they each serve different functions in terms of you know, having you know, the U.S. Navy serve its purpose. So it's a clear recognition that there's a major anchor tenant or capital ship, which is the aircraft carrier. Uh, and I would describe, you know, a sales force or Atlassian and JIRA or a workday as that, you know, main uh, dominant, let's call it what it is, or the most you know, important piece of software for a certain function, whether it's HR or sales or development. But there are all these things on the edge of that, like M&A integration, that uh, there, it may not be purpose-built for those types of um, other uh, jobs or other purposes, and that's why there's a supporting cast around the capital ship. And so, you know, uh, I, we think of, or I think of, uh, horizontal tools like Process Street as some of that very important uh, surrounding cast or, or around that, you know, that, that main ship, so to speak. I think we've confused people plenty <laughs> with all these different analogies. <laughs> so uh, love that idea, though, just being able to build like there's all these little small supporting like workflows and bits of work that need to get done to actually move the main like team forward or the main initiative forward. And the, the, the big product, the sales force, it's great at its core things, but there's lots of things that it's not great at and it needs supporting tools to help make the entire kind of project successful. So maybe tying that to my next question, um, I, one thing we hear a lot that people like about being able to tie these and integrate these tools together is they're often able to start to automate a handoff that may previously have been manual, which can be a massive savings, uh, time, money, resources for their teams. Um, right. I know you've, you've worked a lot in the, in the automation space, Rich, and it's a topic that seems to get hotter every year and really curious what you think uh, what you think makes it, makes it about the current time we're in to make automation so in demand and and maybe thoughts on the future on what's still left to bite off here no I, I think we're still at the early days of um, uh, of really uh, reducing the non-value added you know manual work you know just to go back to you know, uh, my company for a second. I mean, just I got up early this morning and was looking at, again, I'm using this example, for some finance reports, and there's some decisions that we have to make as a, as, a, as a group later today. So I spent all this time cutting and pasting screenshots from a certain report into certain channels in Slack. So, hey, check this out. We're going to have to make a decision about this. or And that, I don't mind doing it. You would think, luckily, there is Slack, and so that's an easy way to communicate to certain groups, and you can assign action items to certain folks. But that's just not a super value-added thing to do. Um, uh, it would be far better if certain reports sort of auto-posted, and then we could just look at the exceptions or make decisions about that. So I think that's a very real example. We all have examples like this. It's not you know, just my, my example. And so, you know, the, you know, the point, I think, is, is fundamentally about taking non-value-added manual work so that you can focus on what matters. And I think we're a long ways from getting all that to happen because we're only just getting the cross-functional systems to be tied together. Uh, so once we achieve that, then you can actually automate. But we're still in the early innings of that, of that precondition. Awesome. Yeah, Vinay, I know we've we've layered a lot of automation functionality into Process Street um, in recent months and years. And any any sort of guiding uh, guiding beliefs we have around the around the topic that are uh, informing our product roadmap. Well, again, back to the keynote, automation is one of the core like tenants of modern process management that we believe, you know, any, any business that's trying to get to phase three of process maturity needs to embrace. There's so much work, like Rich said, that humans are doing that is not adding value that humans don't need to do that machines can do better. And so I think we're just at the beginning of unlocking that. Um, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about, and actually this is one of the real um, like opportunities and platforms that Process Street had and enables us to to actually um, be exist and be alive, and uh, you'll see this on the, on the other the other conversation that we're having with Wade from Zapier, is like the proliferation of APIs has been something that's basically enabled automation to be, to to become so much more democratized 
and uh, essentially allow people to access it through these no code methods. And you know, Zapier, which has been a great partner for us, has been critical to this around um, allowing us to just plug into thousands of other different products out there and, and allow our customers who are not technical to be able to actually build and manage those configurations and integrations. And if there wasn't that, if it wasn't for the fact that they were already using a whole suite of other software products who had opened their APIs and en enabled other products to connect into them, um, we wouldn't be able to, to build such simple automations. We would need heavier lifts from engineering and more support. And that kind of like makes the, the, the friction and the cost of actually being able to utilize these automations for simple day-to-day -day tasks unattainable. And so I think that shift in the market of like, all the SaaS companies being open with their APIs and supporting it with documentation and third party products helping to kind of connect into those different systems has been like a real unlock for automation for a lot of businesses. Uh, Rick, I've heard, you, I've heard you talk before about just how as, as a venture capitalist, you're always looking for trends and to tap into and sort of what's the next wave to ride. I think a lot of our, uh, probably our audience here today maybe are looking for trends and waves in order to develop their own careers. Maybe they're betting on no code and building a career as a no code builder inside a, inside a company or, or looking at automation trends. Um, curious what advice you might have for maybe people earlier in their career who are looking for the next emerging trends to tap into and the, the waves to sort of bet their career on. You know, I, I think there's, um, uh, no simple answer to that, if I may say. We're, we're always searching for it ourselves. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what I try to do, um, but I certainly don't know if I always you know, get it right. Um, you know, maybe the most simple te uh, suggestion or tip I have is to constantly think about who are the 20 smartest people you know of in your network. I would always keep trying to expand my network and ask them what they're reading. <clears throat> mm. And I always uh, ask people this. I often find that, you know, in addition to the standard things that we might all read, whether it's the Wall Street Journal or TechCrunch or TechMeme or, you know, uh, the Hacker News, the, the people that are really expert in certain spaces have a some blog or some uh, you know, deep thinker that is not obvious to the general po population. It's not obvious to the general business press. Maybe it, you know, something super deep in crypto or in aviation or the electrification of aircraft or something just to totally random. And I try to balance um, the normal reading of the feed that we all look at, you know, all the normal sort of tech VC stuff, to try to read some of that very deep vertical stuff and try to understand it. And I feel like when you do that, uh, insights, you'll come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think that's probably the most important tip is to ask the smart people that you know, what, what are they reading? And, uh, and have a discipline of constantly going over that. Uh, when we have more time, I'll, I'll throw out another point, which is it's important to also have a healthy cynicism for whatever is at the greatest peak of hype at any moment in time. I often find that you know, if you were to you know, go back three years ago, but what was the hottest topic on TechCrunch or whatever, I mean, it's nothing against TechCrunch. They do actually an excellent job. But if they're a good test of what's you know, hot in Silicon Valley at any point, just, just go back three years and what was the, the hottest uh, topic you often find um, it doesn't always end up being, you know, what was predicted. And so finding that right balance of sort of cynicism and having your own filter, I would say, is the second thing I'd, um, you know, I tell people to consider. Are there uh, any things that you're reading right now that would be interesting? You know, there, there's an economic blogger that I find totally fascinating called Wolf Street that somehow goes and digs out really interesting economic data about interest rates and housing prices and how rents are changing. And, um, you know, I, for some, I've looked for other places that might cover this base level of economic data, both in the U.S. and globally, and I haven't found anybody else covering it. He talks about used car prices. It's really fascinating, actually. And so I, I, I enjoy I read that almost every other day just to sort of see what new things he's posted. Um, Wolf Street. Sounds kind of like the hustle, the hustle trends. Um, oh. I'll drop something I'm listening to right now. I think we're about to finish up, but uh, Kevin Rose has a couple of new podcasts. He has one called Modern Finance and one called Proof that are ones on crypto and ones on NFTs. And they're both really interesting. He interviews like Beeple and the founder of Solana and like a bunch of interesting people. Yeah. Well, 
great advice all around, great conversation all around. I'm sure we could stay here all day, but uh, we more sessions to get to. But Rich, Finay, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Blake. See you in the next one. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, Finay. Great to see you guys. Awesome. Oh, hey, look who's joining us. I'm back. I was um, meeting with my manager about my next gig, which I'm going on tour. Just kidding. I was totally <laughs> helping out a customer. Dad Absolutely. joke tour. Yes. <laughs> 2022. Um, right. Awesome. That was that was great. I want to say, um, Vinay just mentioned a couple of podcasts that are awesome. And so stay tuned for this very next session, our last session, which is not actually a session, it is a sneak preview. You guys are the very first people on planet Earth to get to witness this sneak preview of our own podcast, which is a Masters of Process. Um, so this is a new podcast that Process Street is launching in collaboration with No Code Ops. So that's really exciting. And this this episode that you're gonna get to get a sneak preview of features co-founder and CEO of No Code Ops, Philip Lincoln, and our very own Blake Bailey, who you've got to meet today if you haven't already known him, along with Curtis Cummings and Michael Gill from On Deck. So um, if you want the entire episode and you want future episodes, um, we launch on Friday and you can get it everywhere podcasts are found. And then also you could go to process.st slash blog to get new episodes uh, in your inbox. So that's process.st slash blog to sign up for our newsletter, get episodes in your inbox, but you get to be the very first to uh, get a sneak preview of this podcast that's coming up. That's awesome. And I can't, I can't think we can end this without a last joke. Anybody? Oh my gosh. To? We right. need a dad joke immediately. Okay. So I'll try to squeeze that two in. But um, so I've been thinking about meditation, just something I've, I've been thinking of taking up. Um, I just figured it's better than just sitting around doing nothing. Yes. But I'm bum bum. That right. is the perfect one to take <laughs> us home. I love it so much. Hey, um, everyone that is listening here, what we are really curious about is what you would like to see in Highway 2022 and future events. So what was what worked for you this time? What would you like to see more of? Do you want to see more demos? Do you want to see more panels, more tips and tricks? Yeah, customer stories, customer demos. What would you like to see? What was valuable to you this time? And maybe there's something we haven't thought of at all that you think would be awesome for future events. Tell us in the chat for sure. Um, yeah, what else, Pauline? Um, well, I know, I feel like everything was covered, but uh, I missed the tips and tricks, which was my, my jam. But um, yeah, anybody else have some? But yeah, Angie's with me. More demos, okay. Angelica loves the demos. Oh, Marta, it's your first time being exposed to Process Street? Is that, awesome. is that right? That's awesome. Yeah, very cool. Demos, not yeah. such high level overviews, more specific. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Keep your, keep your suggestions coming. We definitely want, want to know what you would like more of. Also any, again, takeaways that you had from today, um, feel free to pop those in there as well. This is really helpful for us to, to dish you up more of what you want. Um, yeah. And it was really fun to have you all here. Thanks so much for all the awesome participation. Um, it was just really great to sort of get to know you throughout these sessions. And um, that was awesome. And we will definitely be in touch with more. Stick around for the sneak preview of the podcast coming up in wow. about two minutes. Yeah. Cool, guys. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. Enjoy this podcast sneak preview. And we will talk soon. If there's anything you need, reach us at support at process.st anytime. <laughs>